Peter Vesey here, uh, another special interview, uh, another segment of Hoop Du Jour with Michael Ray Richardson. Um, Michael, I'm excited to talk to you. I'm and, glad and, to be here, Pete. We go way back. And anytime, anytime I run into you, you know, over the years, or I get a phone call from you, you know, I, you're one of the guys that, when I see your name on my phone, I pick it up on the first ring. Well, that's a good thing because you never know what I was going to say, so you're always picking it up. Oh, oh, always <laughs> picking it up, right? Right. Whether whether it was whether it was good times or, or bad times, uh, we we always stayed together. Yes. And, and uh, he said to me yesterday when we when we saw each other that, uh, you know, yeah, you wrote this about me and you wrote that about me. I said, yeah. I said, but Michael, I said, I always had your back. And what did you say? And my front too. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I've had you back to front yeah. since, since you were drafted. Yes. yes. Um, Michael, tell, tell me about the draft process for the Knicks. Um, I, I, I really, you know, all the years I've, I've been around you, I've never actually asked you how it happened that you were drafted number four. So how it really happened was earlier that my senior year, I was projected to go in the second round, by, and I was going to be drafted by the Chicago okay, Bulls. Senior year where? At the University of Montana. Okay. So, during that year, we had played a game up in Flagstaff, Arizona, and Willis Reed had came to see me play. And he was coaching the next day? He was coaching the New York Knicks at the the time. He was coaching. So, I guess that they had a game in that area, maybe in Phoenix or somewhere at the time. Probably, So, he was there. He came to see me. And so, after that, uh, when the season was over, that they had a senior uh, tournament in Hawaii. So when I got to Hawaii and played in the tournament, I went from from like being picked in the second round up to the first round, and because I played so Who's well. Who was telling you that? You had an agent telling you that? Uh, or a, your school was telling you that? Uh, a guy by the name of of uh, Don Cronson, which which you know, know very well. Agent, agent, agent Don, Don Cronson. Yeah. Okay. So I saw him in Hawaii, and we was talking. Okay. And I had played, uh, you know, really, really well. And so I went from a, from a high second to like a high first. Not a high and first. I, and I was very high Knicks. first. Yes. Very high first. Yeah. I went number four. Right. In the first round. Number four. And, and Larry Bird was in that draft as a junior eligible. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you can give me any insight into this, but I had heard over the years that uh, Sonny Werblin was running the garden at that time, that either he wanted to take Bird as a junior eligible, and Willis insisted on you. Do you have any any knowledge about that? I didn't really know. I don't know anything about that. All I know is that I was drafted in right. the fourth. And I think Larry, he was, he was drafted seven, mm-hmm. number five, wasn't he? Se- I think, I, you know, I'm not sure, seven or eight mm-hmm. or something like that. Se- but, but, so, but Boston had to wait on him. Yeah, yeah, but, but I don't know anything about that. Yeah, but it was kind of interesting because really over the years, of course, you know, oh, the Knicks passed on Larry Bird Jr. Yeah. But but you never know. Yeah, you never know. And uh, Indiana was after him at the time, too. Yeah, because he was an Indiana kid. Indiana kid. So, I mean, it's just it's so interesting the way it happened. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it's funny. You go you go number four uh, to the Knicks. And you told me, though, at one time that the uh, the Bulls were interested in you, right? Yes. I was, yeah. I was, I was, uh, I was, I guess I was going to be drafted by the Bulls. This is what I was told just before I went to Hawaii. And then when I got over there and played so well, I moved up and I was taken by the Knicks. Right, so you would have been a teammate of? Michael Jordan. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, I know him too. So, so, so for three years, for people who don't go back that far, uh, for at least three years, you were the second best guard in the NBA on both ends of the court to Michael Jordan. I, w- I would say I was the first, but you say the second, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I let the league in steals, let the league in assists, and let the league in minutes played. Right. So, I mean, yeah. you could have been Pippen before Pippen. Yeah. yeah probably, probably. But then he would have been saying crap about you in his in his uh, documentary. Uh, well, well, it probably would have been all good. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, tell me, tell me, like, I mean, the, the greatest thing about your story is is that you come back from having a drug habit and th- was thrown out of the league. And then what, what happened to you after? What you well, what you become? What you become afterward? I mean, I, that was just something that I went through. 
But like a lot of people don't know that I was the first player banned, but I was also the first player reinstated. Uh, when I got over to Italy in 1988, uh, I played for a guy named Bob Hill, who coached in the league. And my second year, I had a chance to come back to the Philadelphia 76ers. At the time, the coach was uh, Gene Shu, and the owner was uh, Harold Katz. Because Johnny Dawkins had just got hurt, he had tore his knee up, and they had, you know, called me and they wanted me to come back. But the reason why I didn't come back, because they only wanted to offer me one year, and I wanted two-year guarantee. So I just stayed over there, which I think I made a great choice, because I was able to play till I was 46. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so interesting. I, mean, I never knew that. So mm -hmm. Philadelphia came after you. Yes. The team that you beat in 1984 as defending champions yes playing for the nets you won in five games uh, one of the most historic one of the most unbelievable series ever because each team won on each other's floor well what happened was <laughs> we had went to philly and we won the first two came home and we kind of relaxed and they won the next two and in game five i remember going to philadelphia to play game five Julius Irvin had put in the newspaper, big headlines. You might as well mail in the stat sheets because it's over. You got a good memory. And when we and when everybody <laughs> read that, everybody said, "Listen, we've already won two there. Let's let's go back home and close it out." And that's what we did. What a what a great series. Stan yes. Albeck was your coach. Yeah. Um, Otis Bird song in the back court with you. Albert King, Buck Williams, Corrin, Buck Williams, Dawkins. Williams yeah. Dawkins. Oh, we had, we had a hell of a team. Hell back of a then. team. And then you go on to the uh, the second round and you play in Milwaukee and you beat them in the first game. Yes. Mike Jaminski on that team also. Yes, yes. And uh, you beat them beat them in Milwaukee. And I remember, I remember walking off the floor with Mike right after the game. So now this is the fourth game in a row you won on the road. And uh, he said to me, Pete, he says, there's, there's no place like a way. <laughs> well, well, there wasn't any. Really, you know, uh, playing away from home, there's no pressure. So we was able to get on the road and relax. And whatever happened, you know what I mean? Right. Because no one really picked us to do, you know, win anyway. Right. So we didn't have any Which pressure. Which is amazing because you had a hell of a team. Yeah. So, so game, you know, some things I, I, I know verbatim, man, like mm -hmm. as if it was yesterday. So game, the next game, you're beating them at the half, beating the Bucks again at the half. And I think early in the third quarter, you come over to me on the sidelines and you said, Pete, Game series is over. It's over. <laughs> and and so and then Dawkins Dawkins gets I think he got in a fight with Dunleavy or he, he did, did he, he did right he hit him with the ball what yes. what happened there he hit him with the ball hit him with the ball yeah and and all of a sudden it just flipped the Bucks the it Bucks just flipped went, and they because beat. at that time the Bucks were sleeping right and Daryl did something to Dunleavy and they just woke up and it was it was over. <laughs> oh my god. You were right though. It was yeah. over. <laughs> Wrong team though. Exactly. Yeah, but they had a hell of a team that year. Oh no. Yeah. Sidney no. Moncrief, Junior Bridgman. Definitely. Scott Wedman. They had a hell of a team. Yes. Yes. Um, Michael, when you came into the NBA, were you like I seem to remember you telling me this. You basically drinking milk all the time. You never had a beer. I either. mean, yeah, I mean, I, I like even in college because I was on a mission. You know, I was trying to get to the league. I mean, I, I, I my first drink it was a it was like a beer my second year in the league. So I really wasn't into it, you know. And, and then I got you know I got to New York, started you know hanging around with the wrong people, and boom. And the next thing you know, boom. Because you never think that it could happen to you, right? You know, but it could happen to anybody, right? Of course. Yeah. Wrong teammates or wrong no, people? not just people, just not you know teammates. I, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, you know. No, your you know, name, I like but uh, I mean, I'll name, was, I'll name. At, but no, <laughs> but at that time it was everywhere. You know what I mean? So, yes, I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, I I don't blame anybody for like what I went through. I I made my bed and I had to sleep in it, and I slept in it, you know, and I just uh, you know kept it moving. You've had you've had some uh, some men that have been very very important in your life. Um, let's let's deal with David Stern first, okay? Uh, David David, I know treated you very very. He's the one who banished you from the league. He didn't. But I, I wouldn't say he banished me because what's I, the word. Everything happened to to me. I brought it on my own. 
Okay. Right. So it wasn't him. Okay. It was me. Okay. And I took that responsibility. But what happened was, at that time, it was all in the league. And if I would have came out and spoke about it, I could have brought the league down. But I kept my mouth closed. And that made it a lot easier for the NBA. Right. Right. So it was it was good for him. It was good for me, you know. So he and I became really, really good friends. And how did that happen? Did he reach out to you? Did you reach out well, to him? Was, like, well, like what, what happened was after I had left the NBA, I went overseas, and the NBA had came over and played in Italy, in Milano. And so I went to the game. So I, I, I hadn't seen him after, you know, after I left the NBA, so I saw him in, in uh, you know, Italy. So I walked up to him at halftime. And I just tell him, you know, I was wanted just to let, let him know that, you know, he probably saved my life, you know, because what he did was he made, he made me open up my eyes to see where I was going, you know, and I that there was no hard feelings. And after that, he and I became real good friends. What was his response when you? Oh, said he was that? happy. Yeah, you know, he had me to come up and sit with him for the whole, uh, you know, second half of the game, and and told me if I ever need anything, just give him a call. So I know that you you did keep that relationship alive till he yeah, died. Yeah, and then even after I stopped playing ball over in in uh, in France, uh, I had got a, I had gave him a call, and there was a there was a uh, NBA office in Paris, so he had given me a job over there for like three years. Unbelievable! So I just kept that relationship. Tremendous. Yeah. So, so I know, I know you tried to get coaching jobs in the league and stuff. Did yeah. he try to help you with that? Did yeah, he... but you know, he tried. But you know, these here owners and these general managers, it's like a, it's like a buddy buddy system. They, they, you know, bring in your, you know, your, you know, right. friends and stuff. Because I remember when the uh, D League first came, he was he was telling us that they were going to have a formal NBA player on every bench. Well, that never happened. Oh. That would, so, have, that would have been great. Yeah. Well, it never happened. So. Still could. But but it was out of his control. It was out of his control. Right. I didn't know anything was out of his control. Uh, what well, that was. Yeah, no, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, all right, so there's that relationship which lasted forever. Yeah. Um, and then and then when you played for the Nets, the owner was, was Joe Tao. Joe Tao, yeah. And you developed an, an incredible relationship with him, and as I did. Yeah. Uh, he, he well, I was always a likable guy, so I mean that, that never. Right, so it was surprising that I actually got along with him. Yeah. But but, <laughs> just, but he did become my my son's godfather. Yeah. And but he uh, was one of a kind. Well, tell tell me tell me tell everybody well, about Joe Tao. Joe was, you know, when I was going through all of my stuff, he was always there. You know, even like the days that I didn't show up or something, he would call me. I would meet him the next day at the diner. We had breakfast. Tell me what's you know what's the problem? I'm there for you, him. So, you know, we, we built a real good bond. So, when after I left the Nets, he and I still became friends. So, I was in France, and I found out that his daughter had passed away from cancer. So, I flew back in, I went to his funeral. So, he found out that I was in there. I was the only player in there. So, then he knew I was in there. So, he sent his secretary up to, uh, you know, bring me down where he was in the front and told me, I don't want you sitting up there. I want you sitting with me because you're part of the family. Yeah. So I sit, sit with him. I went through that, you know, when he was, you know, because when you lose your, you know, when, when, when like anybody loses their child, that's something big, you know. Yes. So at that time, when it was all over, I went to his house and he said, yeah, you see the sugar man, he's here. When he was going through his problems, I was there. Now I'm going through mine, he's here. And we just built that relationship. I love Joe. I love as Joe. As you do, yeah. Yes. No, he, he was an un unbelievable guy. I, I remember he, he even took it upon himself to uh, to hire Larry Doby, who was from Patterson, where yes. he's from. Yes. And he had he had Larry, they took him away from baseball, and uh, he, put, he put him on the payroll with the Nets, and he had him travel with the Nets, with you. Yeah, but I was, he's supposed to be taking care of me, but I was taking care of Doe. Oh, tell me about that. <laughs> tell me about that. <laughs> no, so we, we would go on the road. You know, Doe, he was a professional baseball player at the time. So right. when he was Doe, he just liked to, you know, get away, get on the road, you know. He did his little stuff on the road, but that's between me and Doe, you know. But we became really, <laughs> really good that's friends. That's the record for me. Yeah, <laughs> but we became really, really good friends, you know. So it wasn't like that. Me and me and Doe were really good friends. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, to Hall of Fame, he's the second second yeah. black player in, yeah. in Major League Baseball. Yeah. You know, and as a matter of fact, Joe had built a field and a statue of Joe, of Larry in Patterson, New Jersey. And I went to the opening of that. Yeah, I was there. You were there too. Yeah. And he, matter of fact, uh, Yogi Bear was there too. Yeah, it was. That was a great day. It was a great day. Yeah, a great day. Yeah, he he re, he uh, really really loved uh, the Dogs. Well, he idolized him because he was a little younger than him, and then he saw him play. Well, Dobie. I remember that he used to tell us some stories about when, like, him and Dope went to the movies, that Dope's had to go upstairs, and that he had to stay downstairs. So the blacks was upstairs, right. the whites was downstairs. In, so, Jersey, so, so, in Jersey. Yeah, and so he never could fig he never could figure that out. Why? Right. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Joe had a lot to do with the, him finally getting into the Hall of Fame. You know, we pushed that big time. We got a lot of important people involved, and, and he should have been in it years and years before that. But uh, and Larry used to go out to eat with us. You know, yeah, he was a nice guy. Oh my! God. Always go to the uh, River Pond. Yes, yes. We used to always go to the River Pond. And I would, I would hope he'd be telling baseball stories. And he, he told a few. You know, yeah. he told us how how it took Joe DiMaggio a long, long time. For him to say hello mm -hmm. when they were crossing the lines, you know, in yeah. between innings, took him, took him. Yeah, I, that was I, a tough time back then. Well, I understand. It was it was years. He said mm -hmm. took years for him to. Ted Williams, on the other hand, he said the first time it happened, Ted Williams was right there saying, mm -hmm. "Welcome, welcome to you know." Yeah. I love those stories, That's man. Those, like, <laughs> those yeah. unbelievable stories. Yeah. Yeah. And then Joe, and then Joe got you involved. I know you're still involved with his charity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we do is. We've been doing it for the last 10 years. Joe was a big giver to the kids in Patterson. So for the last 10 years, me and Otis Burson, we have a company called Ball Stars Youth Camps, where we go around the country and do free basketball camps for underserved kids. So Joe made sure that for the first three weeks of August every year that we was going to come back and do a camp for all those kids. And we, we average about 125 kids a week. And I, I think one of the rules of that camp is is that uh, you you have to your schoolwork has to be. Oh yeah, all of our programs. It's not you know basketball is just a way to get the kids there, but we mostly try to give them life skills, you know, like safe neighborhoods, like bullying, like drugs and alcohol, you know, uh, financial literacy. So we try to bring them in j just into the real world. So just basketball. It's just a way of getting in front of them, and, and it works. You're reaching them. We're you're reaching them. Definitely. Yes. You stay in touch with those kids. Now you've been doing it how many well, years? Now? We've been doing it for uh, ten years. Ten years. But now. like a lot of the like a lot of the kids that went through our program has done play ball overseas. Done play ball, and uh, there's a lot of f females that played in you know Cincinnati in Connecticut that that like went through our program. Went through the program. Yeah. Well, I mean, Patterson has always had a lot of great athletes. Yeah. So again, getting back to Doby, he was like Jackie Robinson, like like Thorpe. Mm -hmm. They could play every sport. Yeah, I mean, he could play. I like those. Could oh man, could play football. Yeah. Could play any anything. Basketball, he was great. That's why Joe loved him. Yeah, and but Joe, he, he would love any everybody. Joe didn't. He, Joe, Joe didn't. I don't think he really had a, like a bad bone in his body. Yeah, because he tried to help everybody. Right. Yeah. Tell tell us about. When you went out, you're in Oklahoma now, mm -hmm. uh, but you're not you're not teaching anymore. Not, no, I was doing some. I was doing early on when I came back from overseas. When I came back from overseas in 2003, I worked for the Denver Nuggets for a couple of years. I had called to David, and he had got me a job working for the Denver Nuggets. As doing a, what? As a community ambassador. Okay. So I was going out speaking to kids in school, doing little basketball clinics. And Is stuff. that where you're from? Yeah. Yeah. College. And then I did that for a couple of years. And then I decided to get into coaching. So I, I took a job in the, in the CBA coaching up in Albany right. for a couple of years. Right. And then I, I left there and went to Oklahoma, coached for like three years. And then left there and coached for three years in Canada. Where when I, I was in a championship series, eight years, won five championships. You were very successful yeah. everywhere. Yes. So this is one thing that, you know, really, it touched me. When you you invited me up to Canada for the opening of a game, yeah. you know, and I was like, it's amazing that you know everything that we've been through. Oh yeah, but the, you know, life is strange, and it's not about it's not about holding grudges or anything. You know what I mean? You just gotta be open. You know, right? But you know, 
you got to treat everybody with respect. If you want respect, you got to treat people with respect. And that's how I live. And then, and then you became a teacher. I came. I became a substitute teacher because I was just wanted to do something, just get out of the house. Uh huh. And you know, with these here young kids, to, to, to where you know, they, there's a, there's a lot of problems in the you know school, school. So I, I did that for a couple of years, but you gotta have a lot of patience. Right. These, these kids are, it's a total different generation. They'll they'll talk to you. No, oh, they talk to you crazy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been yeah. told that by yeah, they talk to a you lot crazy. of people. Um, well, that that was that was an amazing part of your life. Yeah. Now you're not you're not working now. No, you I was what I was doing was. Then after that, once again, David had put me in a situation where I could go over and coach and teach players over in that, like Africa, India, China, Australia, with the NBA basketball academies. So I was going over there like 14 days out of a month, you know, training players and stuff. And then when the, the uh, pandemic hit, it just stopped everything. So, you know, now me and my wife, we own a uh, hair salon. We have a pretty good clientele. So... Uh, What's you her know, name? Her name is Kim. All right, so Kim. she works at the shop and I work at home. I cook, I clean, I do all the stuff at home. Uh -huh. And you still have your camps all over? I still have my camps during the summer. Okay. Now tell me tell me about your kids. And I've so, always I've always said this about about you. I said, you know, you you, you want to know about Michael Ray. Check out his kids. See how see how they I mean see I see what's happened to them in their lives. Yes. I have five kids. My my oldest is forty four. She lives in Denver. She's a stay-at-home mom. Her name is Tasha. I have a son that's 40, lives in New Jersey. His name is Corey. He's a fireman. Then I have a daughter that's 34, who's a doctor in New York. And what kind of doctor? She's a uh, pediatrician. So she, she lives in New York, which I'm always there because she has a three-year-old kid. So I always go in and see my grandbaby. And then I got two kids in the South of France. I got a son that's 19 and I got a daughter that's 25, but my son plays professional, but he plays professional soccer. What's his name? His name is, his name is Michael Amir Richardson. Is he spelled differently, Michael? No, it's spelled the same. <laughs> it's M-I-C-E-A-L. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, how proud are you? Who are you, who are you proud of most? All I'm of proud them. proud of all of them. All of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's, there's no difference, but no, I love just, them all. I love being at the table with, uh, you had your daughter and, the, and your two sons, they mm -hmm. were in from uh, from Europe, and I, I don't know how long ago that was, but I know I remember your daughter was almost finished with becoming a doctor. Yeah. That time. Those were those great, that's when you were in for the camps. Yeah. No, I mean, was, what I tried to do is, is I tried to teach hard work with, with my kids. If you work hard, you're going to be successful. Life isn't easy, and there's nothing given to you. You have to earn it. And if you go through things in life, it's just part of it's, it's just part of learning. You know, there's no one has lived a perfect life. Amen. So, Michael, I'm proud of you. I got to, I've said that to you many times, and uh, I'm proud too. If I, they, they, and you should be, yeah. and you should be. And if we were, if we were in an arena, I would give up, I'd get up, and give you a standing ovation. But the most important, I can do it anyway. Yeah. But but the most important thing I'm <laughs> worried about, I'm blessed. I'm blessed that I have. My, my good health, because without that you can't you can't do nothing. You know, through all the stuff that I went through, I could have like you know messed up my body or something. But right. I'm blessed to have uh, to have uh, you know great health. It just shows what kind of an athlete you were. Yeah. That, that yeah. yeah. Mike, thank thanks thank so, you, thank, thanks, thanks for having thanks me. Awful. Oh, man, this this has been great. Thanks, Pete. I love thanks it. for having me. Thank you. Another segment of Hoop Du Jour. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Always. <laughs> I call him Pistol Pete. Ha, ha, ha.